The first thing I would want to offer is a word of thanks to every one of you and every person in every pew across Holston for your prayers and your support for the delegation, your prayers for, for our church as we have gone through this, this last year. After annual conference last year, uh, one of the lay members from the New River District came, gave me a call and then came by the office and she had the picture that was in one of the annual, con or the annual conference newspapers during annual conference last year, the one that had the picture of all the delegates. Um, she took the picture, cut it out, put it in her Bible, and then she told me, I'm laying hands on you every day and praying for you by name every day between now and general conference. And then several times during the year, she just wrote me a note to say, just want you to know I'm still praying for you. I have never felt more prayed for and supported with prayer in my life, and I think the rest of our delegation would say that too. It got to the place where I started asking people, please don't stop praying for us cold turkey after general conference because I'm afraid I will just disintegrate into a heap if I have to feel like I'm doing it all on my own. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your engagement. We had opportunities last year to, to have over 2,000 people who attended information and question and answer sessions around the annual conference. Thank you for that. Thank you that on the Sunday after general conference at our three, three, at three gatherings in each district, over 3,000 people came out to, to share communion together and to know that the ground was still solid beneath our feet. I am not going to try to give you an account of everything that happened at general conference. You've read about much of that. I will make a few observations. But first, I have a request, and that request is that you give to me some grace this morning. I think I'm going to need it because these are tender times, and we are very sensitive in the words we use with one another. So let me just say up front that my intention is not to be hurtful or harmful or derogatory to anybody. And if I get the words wrong, I hope that you'll look at them, try to find the meaning behind my feeble attempts. Observation number one. Jim's granddad used to say that if two people agree on everything, one of them is not necessary. I love it. Well then, every single one of us is absolutely essential. Because we don't agree on everything. Amen. Observation number two, we all love the church. We love each other and we want what is best for the church and for each other. It was nothing short of awe-inspiring that first day at General Conference when we spent a whole day in prayer for our church. We had opportunities to hear the amazing things that are taking place all over the world as part of the United Methodist Connection. We had opportunities to pray together, to pray in silence, to lift one another up, and it was our church at its very best. That's what we all want. And I don't care who you talk to, left, right, central, whatever label you want to put on us, we all want the same thing. We want a church that is renewed and revived and living into the calling that Christ has placed upon all of us. That's observation two. Observation three, as much as we want that, our denomination is doing harm. And when one of our, when our first general rule is John Wesley's admonition, do no harm, that's a big deal. That's a problem for us. We do harm to persons in our church who affirm they are people of one book, and that one book is the Bible. And they read and study and earnestly, honestly, prayerfully, passionately interpret its meaning as the church has traditionally interpreted that the practice of homosexuality is contrary to the will of God for humanity. It's the practice, not the person. But they are labeled as hateful troublemakers 
who refuse to at least agree to disagree or just live and let live. How is it that we can pray for God's will for a year and a half for our church at General Conference and then at the end of the General Conference immediately start to resist and reject? No matter where you are, can we not see this is harming us? We do harm to LGBTQ plus members when we pass a traditional plan that says we love you, we welcome you as a person of sacred worth, we will baptize you and confirm you, we will give you a seat in the choir and a place on the church council, but you can't use the sanctuary for your wedding to the person you've chosen to spend your life with because we won't marry or ordain you. You're incompatible with Christian teaching. Can't we see? Can't we all at least see? That's causing us harm, and that is hurtful. Observation number four. Our denomination may be broken. 864 people working as a committee of one under Robert's Rules of Order may not be the way we're going to get to the place we need to be. But I am a firm believer that our local churches are not broken. And there are some things we can do. No one of us in this room can say where we might find ourselves as a denomination in one or two or ten years. But I believe we can determine how we arrive. We can concentrate on our mission, making disciples. Isn't that what we want to do? Isn't that what we long to be able to get back to doing? Wouldn't it be amazing if we could concentrate on attacking the opioid crisis with this, just as much energy as we have the capacity to attack one another? What an amazing thing that would be. <laughs> Friends, we are not the enemy. The last time I checked, Satan was the enemy. Amen. He's the one we're supposed to be attacking. And then I would say to us, we can do the things we do best. When I left General Conference, when I finally got back home, I said to Jim, I am going no place else but to my home church on Sunday morning. There was no other place I could possibly be. I just needed to know that in spite of everything that happened in St. Louis and all the things we were trying and are still trying to figure out, that there was a place where the ground was solid and firm beneath my feet. And there were people who loved and cared for me. And you know what? Not one, not one thing that happened in St. Louis changed a single person in my home church on Sunday morning. Amen. Not one. And then I felt like a a person dying of thirst who made it to a spring of water when we were able to gather at St. Paul United Methodist Church in the New River District and that place was packed out. The balcony was full, the choir loft was full, people were sitting in the wind. As it reminded me of that story in Acts where a fella got sleepy and fell out. So I just had to, to make the sermon short, but oh my goodness, I needed that. I needed to come together and, and have the bread and, and taste from the cup and know that, that we were solid because that's what we do best and we can do that. We can't do anything here at Hol in Holston Annual Conference to change the discipline. That's just not how we're set up. We can't do that. So I would suggest between now and General Conference 2020 and what's com what comes after that, since we can't do anything to change that here in our annual conference, can we agree to give some space 
Can we agree to do that much to give space and grace to the other side, whatever or whoever the other side is? Can we give enough grace and enough space to let them, whoever they are, meet and figure out if they can, can, can come up with a way forward? And it would, be, would it be okay for, for us to meet whoever we are and wherever, wherever we come down on this and try to figure out if maybe there's some place that will help, some way we can come to a, a, a place that will move us to where we need to be? Can we just give that space? And can I just make a quick word about how we, how we speak to one another? Can we talk to each other and not at or about each other? Here's, here's what I'm going to promise to do, and you all can hold me to it, and I hope you will. I'm not going to post anything on any kind of social media about all the things that we're struggling with as a denomination. I'm not going to post anything about the division. If I want to talk about that, I'll get on a Facebook page that's committed to that. I'm going to start posting only those things. And what if we did this? What if we posted only those things that would help us in our efforts to win people to a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are things that cultivated our own relationship with Jesus and with others? I think that might make a bigger difference. How about you? So I'll finish it up this way. Here are some Here's some dreams. Between now and General Conference 2020 and however long it takes us to, to work through what all of that will mean, what if, what if we threw our labels, our buttons, our badges into a heap and just declared that we're followers of Jesus? What if our LGBTQ members were allowed to just be members instead of an issue? What if traditionalists... What if traditionalist members were just allowed to be members and were not labeled as homophobic or bigoted? What if we acknowledged that liberals love and honor the authority of scripture and conservatives love and honor the sacred worth of all people? What if we left here committed to walk so close behind Jesus that we are covered in the dust that's kicked up from his sandals so much that we all look absolutely alike because we look like him. <laughs> Sunday was Pentecost Sunday when the Spirit hovered over a group of people in an upper room who surely did not agree on everything but who were there just because Jesus commanded them to go and watch and wait and pray for what came next. That's where we find ourselves here today. We are gathered in this room. Dare we make this the place where we commit to return to our churches, to watch and wait and pray and work for a fresh movement of the Spirit, directing us to God's next faithful step. Not because we already agree, but just because that's what he told us to do. Oh, come Holy Spirit. Amen.